This morning, we've got a, the pleasure of having uh, Karim Gerbi uh, to uh, come uh, give us a small intro to um, electrophysiology and uh, mag magnetoencephalography. Um, so Karim, I, I guess many of you know him, he's a prof at, at UDM in psychology, he's one of my colleagues, um, and uh, he's uh, a leading figure in the, in the field of, uh, of MEG and is increasingly working at uh, different ways to apply uh, artificial intelligence in neuroscience, uh, both in terms of uh, kind of processing data, but also in terms of, of modeling the brain processes themselves. Um, he's a director of a newly created uh, network, uh, which is called Unique. And uh, I don't know, Karim, if you want to tell us a, a few words just on, uh, on, on Unique. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Unique has been partnering with the Brenac School since last year, and uh, hopefully this is uh, going to be um, growing uh, and, and staying here for the, for the long run. So without further ado, uh, Karim, I'm handing it out to you. Thanks, Pierre. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure again to be um, um, sharing some brain hacking related uh, matters specifically in the field of electrophysiology uh, at the Brain Hack School, which is turning into an institution now in Montreal. This Brain Hack School, I'm very uh, happy uh, about this and to be to be able to contribute to it. Um, the um, as, as Pierre mentioned, I'm involved in a number of initiatives. Um, he he said I could maybe say something about Unique. So I, I've put the logos at the bottom. I hope you can all see my my slides. Yeah. Um, so Unique Center is a is a center that was created. Um, roughly a year ago now. Um, and it's basically the objective of this new center is to bridge research taking place in neuroscience and in AI and actually try to go beyond just the bi-directional interaction between the two fields to actually move more forward towards developing research that is actually a fusion of both fields with mutual benefits, obviously, for, for both domains. Um, and an important part of that is training the new generation. Uh, as we often say, it's trying to, to, to also train uh, students to become bilingual, if possible, uh, in both fields, basic, basically the um, AI field and, and, uh, and neuroscience, uh, which obviously includes as an important component of it, neuroimaging. Um, there's a lot more I can tell you about Unique, but this is not the object, uh, the purpose today. So you can check out Unique's website, which is unique.quebec. Um, and you can also uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, I'm very happy to be also part of another initiative that you surely have heard about, which is Neuromod. Um, and so there's a lot of overlap and a lot of common interests that um, Neuromod and Unique have. Um, I'm also involved in MILA and at the UNF and other initiatives in Montreal. And I'm sure you've, you've, um, you are all familiar with, uh, with most of these. Uh, the objective of my, my uh, introduction today, so Pierre, I'm just going to check in terms of timing. Um, what I, what I have is basically I have um, one main presentation that could go on for about maybe 45, 50 minutes, um, maybe a bit, bit longer. And then I have two more presentations that I will suggest, uh, depending on the interest maybe of, um, of who's around and, and the students. One is more about uh, connectivity matrix specifically for EEG and MEG, if you're looking at interactions. And the second one is more about brain rhythms and oscillations. So we'll see. I can always also provide the slides just without presenting them. We'll just see on how timing goes and, and what you think makes sense. No, that's great. I think we should go with the first presentation and, and then as you maybe share the slides. Absolutely. And, and we could, um, if people want to have the, the presentation and, and the chance to ask questions, maybe we can try to schedule them uh, either tomorrow or, or, or next week, actually. Um, I suspect that this morning folks are going to want to wrap up their presentation because we have this at once this afternoon. Fair enough. Yeah, okay. that's great. So I'll do the first presentation and I'll, um, and I'll mention the other two or provide the slides and then yeah. we, can, we can take it up from there. That'd be great. wonderful. Excellent. So first of all, I would just uh, once again highlight, I think, the importance of the school that you are all taking part is in. This is actually a very unique endeavor. Uh, and as you can see here from the from the, the picture that, that has been used, uh, that uh, Pierre has used, you see traditional neuroscience at the center of these three circles. Um, 
in my mind, what you are contributing to right now, this school and the is actually train, changing the traditions that we have in neuroscience. So in the future, the tradition, traditional neuroscience is basically going to be all of this, because we are the, is actually the face of how neuroscience is done is actually changing over these last years, and Montreal in general and uh, UDM, UNF, uh, Nova Mode, Unique, all these initiatives, and specifically this Brain Hack School is actually actively changing that alongside all the other brain hack initiatives uh, that are happening internationally. So I think it's very exciting times. Um, and I would have loved to be a student today um, like you are now. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about here is two things. The first part, I'm going to give you some basics uh, for those of you who are maybe less familiar with tech brain imaging or brain electrophysiological techniques such as EEG and MEG, but also intracranial EEG. That's the first part. And then the second part, I'm going to highlight some tools, uh, mainly primarily um, open source tools that you uh, are encouraged to use or that you can consider using um, if some of your projects involve EEG data, MEG data, or intracranial EEG. Um, so I'll give you an overview and some pointers towards some resources that you, that you can play around with. So let's first start with a quiz. My quiz question is, what do these three techniques have in common? One was 1934, 1905, 1923. So nice old black and white pictures. Um, given that I'm not in the room with you, we can't make, we can't make this very interactive. So I'm not gonna ask you to make proposals. Um, I'm gonna assume some of you, or maybe somebody will say, well, maybe these very first EEG techniques or ways of getting brain activity. And obviously this was my tricky question, apart the fact that they're all smiling. So that's one common thing. The second common thing is that all of these methods are used to just um, straighten and add, or add waves to your hair. So it's nothing to do with EEG data. Um, and I'm not sure you see my funny GIF here, but in my, my GIF here is actually uh, hidden by the, uh, the list of participants from the Zoom. So um, I had, um, there's an ostrich here, uh, but you probably don't see that. Uh, or maybe a llama, I think it was. Anyway, so. Getting back now to brain technology, as you now know, there's a wide range of techniques that are used. I will not go through the whole list, but basically there's a, there's a real um, great variety of tools, techniques, and modalities we can use to try and explore, measure, assess brain data um, in function and in dysfunction. Uh, you are probably very much aware of techniques such as fMRI, um, near infrared spectroscopy, um, PET, um, and then there's also um, kind of CT scanners, EEG, MEG, so on and so forth. But what's the difference? Why do we have so many and what's the difference between these techniques? Broadly speaking, some of them will, will be more adapted to looking at anatomy of the brain, where, the, where others are going to be looking at function. Um, some are going to be invasive, others are non-invasive techniques. Um, they differ in terms of temporal precision, which can range from milliseconds to seconds. They also differ in terms of spatial uh, precision, uh, ranging from million millimeters to centimeters. Um, and why is that the case? Why do they differ so much? Basically because the underlying brain signal that these methods detect uh, also differ. So broadly speaking, if you want to um, uh, summarize this, we'd have on one side uh, the, the um, brain's electrical activity that is originating in signals that some of these techniques can catch. On the other side, you have uh, brain vasculature or blood flow. So to look at um, brain electrical activity, we're actually measuring electrophysiological uh, responses. So um, tools that assess this, such as EEG or MEG or intracranial um, EEG recordings, provide a direct measure of neuronal activity. Um, on the right-hand side, however, this, we're looking in this case at hemodynamic uh, metabolic responses, um, techniques such as uh, functional MRI, uh, PET or NIRS, uh, provide an indirect measure of neuronal activity, uh, but nevertheless uh, a reflection of activities going on in the brain that allow for um, localization of brain activities and also more and more improved temporal resolution. So there's, there's a lot of work that has been done also in these fields to improve the, the, the temporal resolution. Now, in terms of electrological brain signals, this is the focus of the talk today. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview. Electroencephalography, EEG, is one technique. Magnetoencephalography, MEG. Uh, there's also two other techniques we call ECOG and SEG. ECOG for electrocorticography um, and SEG for stereoelectroencephalography. 
these two latter techniques are invasive recording. So th this is done in the case of epilepsy patients most of the time who have, um, who are uh, pharmacologically, uh, well, basically drug resistant epilepsy patients. So they require surgery. And if they require surgery, then they will have for a couple of weeks implanted electrodes in their brain, in their brain, either a grid of electrodes or depth electrodes that assess brain activity within the brain. Um, and this also gives access, um, very limited, of course, because it's in the case of some uh, epilepsy patients, but it gives access to uh, high quality uh, data from the brain uh, with high spatial and temporal resolution. Um, and finally, microelectrode recordings. Um, this is done to a lesser extent in humans than it is done in, um, in non-human primates, for instance. Um, but it is certainly done also in some cases in, in human participants. And so this gives access to a single unit or multi-unit um, activity of neurons rather than populations of neurons uh, such as ECOG or SEEG. Um, so as you see, broadly speaking, we can say we have non-invasive and invasive recordings. Uh, the green square or rectangle is for the non-invasive methods. Um, and on the right hand side, you have the invasive techniques. So what about the early days of EEG and NEC? First of all, as some historical overview. Uh, the first non-invasive recordings, uh, EEG recordings in humans were, were done in 1924. Uh, the results were published five years later by Hans Berger um, in Germany. Um, one of the first things that were recorded in this very early EEG um, data is changes in the brain signals recorded with EEG. In other words, changes in electrical activity of the brain when you open or you close your eyes, uh, when you're asleep or when you're, when you're awake, uh, and also changes in these electrical activations um, according to your cognitive uh, task that you're involved with. For example, whether you are moving or not moving or whether you are doing a memory task or not. Um, as you can see, these were very early um, um, figures that this, this is the way people published work back in 1925. Uh, so one question we can ask is, was uh, this Mr. Hansberger the very first to record the brain's electrical activity? Um, so some of you might be wondering, yeah, yes, no, yes, no. Uh, or is this a trick question? Um, it is a, a little bit of a tricky question because actually he's not the first to record brain activity. Uh, others have done that before. He was the first to record it in humans non-invasively. In other words, was just putting electrodes at, on the scalp. Uh, but before that, back in 1875, 1890, uh, there were um, reports of invasive recordings done in rabbits or in monkeys. Uh, this was in 1875, 1890 by Adolf Beck, recordings done in dogs. These were just showed the ability to record electrical modulations of activity from within the brain. Hans Berger was the very first um, researcher or scientist to be able to record these fluctuations of voltage on the scalp level uh, that reflect underlying activity in the brain. So what does EEG look like today? Well, this is, these are here some examples of an EEG high density net. Um, you can go from 32 up to 256 electrodes. Uh, you can have either connected or wireless EEG setups. Um, and you can also have dry or wet electrodes. And this is what we mean by dry and wet is whether you use gel or not to, to improve, improve the conductivity. Um, and so they are also um, being used in all uh, in a wide range of applications, both from a clinical uh, for clinical applications, uh, for uh, research applications, in, in labs with like high density uh, wired setups with with gel to improve connectivity, so to improve the signal quality as much as possible. But more and more, there are also EEG setups that are off the shelf, um, low cost EEG setups that are used uh, in connection with gaming, for example, or with um, basically do it yourself um, EEG with quality of obviously that is less than what you'd expect from a lab grade uh, system. Now, what about MEG? Uh, well, the flex nowadays, if you want to find something out, you will just Google it. So let's Google MEG. One of the things that comes up if you Google MEG is this Meg Montreal Festival. And what, what is the Meg Montreal Festival? This is the Montreal um, Electronic Groove uh, Festival. It has nothing to do with MEG. So you can try again. Let's Google it once more. Um, and this is something else that comes up if you're looking for MEG. You'll see this movie called The Meg, um, which looks quite scary. 
but rest assured, MEG is nothing as such, not so scary. So just you can just keep calm and, and keep loving Meg. I'm just going to give you the real story about MEG as we see it. So this started off in 1968. Uh, David Cohen makes the first very noisy recording of brain's magnetic signals. The basic laws of electromagnetism tell you if you have an electri electric field, you also automatically have a magnetic field that goes with it. Um, so while the, the activity, the electrical activity of the brain was reported as early as back in the 1920s, um, actually getting hold and being able to detect the magnetic field that is produced by the brain, that took way longer and that came only in 1968. Uh, but it was very noisy. In 1970, James Zimmerman invented the technology uh, called SQUID, which is a superconducting quantum interference device, which is able which has a very high sensitivity and is able to record minute, very small magnetic fields, which was not possible before this technology came. This is why two years later, 1972, the same David Cohen of 1968 published another paper, again in science, um, now showing the ability to record magnetic fields um, from the brain's activity um, using uh, this um, uh, squid uh, technology. This was limited to just one channel recording. Uh, this is the very early paper, 1972, by, by David Cohen. Uh, what does MEG look like today? Well, it, this is a typical system. It's a whole head system where you have more than, uh, typically more than 200 uh, sensors. Um, we do have an MEG system at UDM. There's also an MEG system at McGill. Uh, there are the same systems. Both have two, 275 channels to record um, the neuromagnetic fields from the brain. Um, a nice feature of MEG is that you can also combine it with EEG and fMRI, for instance. So EEG, obviously, simultaneously, you can have an EEG setup and be within the MEG headset um, and um, record both signals simultaneously. Um, but you can also do studies where you record on one hand MEG and also fMRI, obviously not simultaneously. You cannot do that so far. Um, but that has a lot of interest. Um, and so for those of you who are interested in doing that, I, I highly recommend uh, you can also talk to us about that because we are developing opportunities um, through the UNF uh, to potentially be able to do that. In other words, uh, acquire the, the same experiment, acquire data from the MEG with the MEG and also the, uh, the fMRI system. Uh, so to run studies where you actually compare both uh, signals because they are very complementary. Now, what about the origins of the EEG and next signal? I'm going to only go briefly through, through this. I could speak way longer about this, but I'm just going to give you an overview. Uh, about where the signals come from that you record with the EEG or with the MEG setup. Um, basically, what we're recording here is what you can see here is these are synapses, and at the synapse, you're going to have a transmission of the um, uh, electrical pulses, and the synapses basically are electrochemical uh, junctions where you have both electrical and chemical um, flow. So um, the two main uh, principal uh, phenomena that arise here that are of interest for us here is either it's first of all the action potential um, which you can see here on the bottom that is short living that goes only for about one millisecond roughly uh, but also um, the uh, EPSP which is an excitatory postsynaptic potential which lasts about five milliseconds. Um, why is this important to look at these differences because um, as, as we said um, MEG and EEG is going to um, be, it's not going to record activity from one single um, unit. Basically, it's, it's going to reflect the summation of uh, synchronized activity. And when we talk about synchronized activity, most of the literature on EEG and MEG will tell you that it's um, the synchronized uh, PSP, so postsynaptic potentials that arise across a population of neurons at one point in time. Um, that will basically sum up and lead to what you're recording on the surface um, of the brain. Uh, why is it not the action potentials? But basically because the action potentials are, sh are short-lived um, and so they are not um, ideal for summation because they will, they, they will cancel each other out. But for, those, for the PSPs, they're longer lasting, so there's much more chance of overlap. So the synchronization is easier to achieve and then you can have uh, activity that is measurable at the surface. Um, now, um, as I said, nowadays EEG setups um, have many more electrodes than in the past, um, and there are many systems that exist um, commercially that allow you to, uh, to record that, many of which, of whom, uh, which are used in the clinical setting. 
Um, one important aspect of EEG and uh, MEG uh, analysis is um, very specific pre-processing uh, steps that allow you to clean the data and deal with artifacts. So what are the main sources of artifacts? The main sources of artifacts are eye movements. Uh, these include eye blinks and uh, saccades. Um, the heartbeat, uh, muscle activity that comes from the neck, the jaws, uh, any movements that are done, um, but also line noise. And there are several options. Uh, three options are listed here to try and um, remove these artifacts. Um, so one of them is to reject artifactual data. So try to identify um, any um, data segments that have um, artifacts and exclude that from your subsequent analysis. Or you can try to correct. In other words, um, try to exclude from the data the components that are noisy but not have to throw out all the data. So this is not data rejection, this would be then data correction. One way to do that is using ICA. Um, or you can pretend to be an ostrich um, and just put your head down in the sand and pretend you didn't see those and try to work with it. This is something that with the advent of um, new techniques uh, that are applied to EEG and MEG data such as um, deep learning, there's more, there's a, a, an interest in trying to see, can we work around, um, noisy data by just having just masses of data and having uh, you know a net networks that will try to um, circumvent the problem without really having to explicitly clean the data that doesn't always work i would not recommend it uh, but there are some instances where it did an okay job uh, to just pretend they were not there so again uh, just to give you an idea of what these artifacts look like you can see here yeah, there are um, examples of what saccades so eye, horizontal eye movements for example would do to your eeg uh, signal you can see it on the top you can see what uh, emg stands for electromyography so that's going to be muscle activity um, you can see that adds high frequencies to the eeg uh, you can see the ekg that represents heartbeat so you can see that you can have those um, typical um, EKG um, responses that um, overlap, that come on top of your um, EEG data. You can have blocking, uh, you can have skin potentials, you can have um, alpha waves. Now alpha waves might be a nuisance if that's not what you're looking for, but it can also be your signal of interest. This is something that, are, that comes often when uh, individuals are drowsy or getting sleepy in the, uh, um, during the experiment, so you can see an increase in alpha activity, uh, which is basically um, rhythmic activity or oscillations around uh, 10 hertz. Okay, that was a quick overview of um, things that you need to think about when you want to clean your data and remove artifacts. Um, and again, one of the techniques that is um, often used uh, would be cleaning your data using ICA. Now, what about data analysis? There are many, many things that you can consider when you're looking at data analysis, depending on what your question is. So I won't have time to go through all of them. Um, I'm just going to go overview, I'll give you an overview of, of a couple of, um, of methods that are uh, used quite a bit. This is a, a figure taken from uh, Catherine talon baudry and uh, Olivier Bertrand's paper published in TICS in 1999. So this is uh, dates back to several years ago, but the principal methods here are still um, uh, valid and, and state of the art in the sense that um, there, there, you can analyze your data in the time domain, but you can also analyze it in the time frequency domain. And so this is what this is all about here. Um, what is an analysis in the time domain? Basically, one, one uh, very standard analysis that, that you do to EEG data or to MEG data is take your, different, your, your multiple uh, trials. So you have several segments, for example, where the individual um, did the task over and over again, like 100 times, uh, looking at a visual stimulus com com coming up on a screen, for instance, or listening to an, an, um, a tone. Um, and then you would take all those trials and you would simply average them. That would cancel out all the variability and the noise across the single trials and would give you a response if there's anything in the data that is phase locked to, to the onset of a stimulus. This is typically, typically what we refer to as being an ERP, an evoked. Uh, response potential or an event related potential um, and evoked responses um, again the best way to look at them is just brute force average your data in time with respect to a, a time t0 in each of those trials and most of the time it's either stimulus onset or the moments that you press a button or something like that now 
doing that is good because that allows you to get rid of a lot of noise and allows you to see some very neat and um, standard um, um, evoked potentials or ERPs. Um, but there are other things in the data that get lost if you simply do time averaging. So one other approach that was proposed is to do time frequency analysis. In other words, we'll look at the temporal and spectral contents of your signal on a trial by trial basis. Um, and then we would average those potentially, and that would give us what we call induced uh, responses. So how does this work? Basically, um, the um, standard technique to do that is to use um, Hilbert transform or uh, wavelet analysis. And this gives you a time frequency representation of your sing uh, signal, like what you see here. So across the X axis, it's time, and the Y axis, it's frequency. And this gives you, uh, on, a single, on each trial, you'll see a response. These responses don't, have, don't necessarily have to be time locked to the onset of the stimulus. They can have a little bit of variability, but because you're computing uh, the power um, across time and frequency, these are all positive values. And when you average all those time frequency maps across all your, single, uh, across all your trials, they will not average out. And so that way, this is why you see at the very bottom on panel E, there is um, in the average, so the mean time frequency map across all trials, the very bottom, you see that there is an induced gamma activity. So we call it gamma because it's in about the range of 40 hertz. Um, this was not present in the, um, in the map um, um, on panel C, because on panel C, we're just using a time frequency map of the averaged time, um, basically the evoked potential. So if you just average across time all your signals, and then run the time frequency map, you'll get what you see in panel C. Uh, so that gives you an evoked response earlier on, but nothing later on. But if you do your time frequency analysis on a single trial basis, and then you average your uh, single trial time frequency maps, then you pick up something that is induced. Why? It's because that this component was not um, phase locked to the onset of the stimulus. So if you try to average it over time, it's just going to cancel out and disappear. But if you first do a time frequency analysis, this is going to give you um, maps of amplitude or power. These are positive values. When you average them across um, all the different trials, they don't um, cancel out and you still have this um, induced response. Okay, and this is very important um, when you're looking at uh, brain oscillations and brain rhythms. You would want to use time frequency analysis or at least uh, spectral analysis where you're looking at frequency. If you're interested in um, typical ERPs or evoked potentials, you can, you, can be, um, you can definitely just use time domain averaging uh, if your hypothesis is really based on how is the ERP going to change across conditions or across populations um, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, another important thing to keep in mind, um, and I won't have time today to go into the maths and the detail of source reconstruction, um, is that with both EEG and MEG, um, basically you're recording data at the, at the sensor level or at the electro level on the scalp. Um, but what you could do also is from that, you try to infer the activity at the cortical level. This is a process we refer to as source estimation techniques. There are many tools for source estimation. Um, basically, the way these work is that you have an underlying forward model, which tells you how the activity on the cortex uh, leads to recordings at the sensor level, giving the specific geometry of your system, the position of your sensors with respect to the head, and also the model that you're using for your brain. And then you basically try to minimize um, the difference or the error, let's say, between um, your, uh, the predictions of your forward model for different configuration of sources um, and the, the actual data that you have recorded um, at the sensor. And so solving that problem is an inverse, uh, is what we call solving the inverse problem in EEG or MEG, which is basically how can I go back from what I've recorded at the sensor level to figure out what happened down at the cortical level. It's a mathematical problem for which several solutions exist. None of them is 100% uh, ideal and perfect. Um, because they rely on different um, assumptions. So as I said, there's the forward problem, which is how do I go from the, the activity um, on the cortical level to what I would record at the sensor and the sensor space. Uh, the inverse problem is just the opposite of that. I have data at the sensor space. 
um, what what is how can I estimate what happens what is happening at the source level? Um, one important thing to note about this the forward problem, as I mentioned, is that um, it's a lot about geometry and the uh, model that you're using for the brain and the uh, the position and uh, the distance that those um, that this model uh, of the brain has with respect to the, the, the sensors. Um, there are different models that you can use for, um, for the brain. Um, the very simple, simplistic models are spherical models, um, but you can also have more realistic models by uh, using um, boundary element uh, methods, um, or also uh, finite element methods, uh, um, such as um, at the, at the, the third figure you can see down here, which is a sort of still a realistic model. Um, here um, it's inhomogeneous and anisotropic. I won't go into the details more of the forward model, but I can discuss them for those who are uh, who are interested. Um, we also model the source the sources as the activity of the brain uh, using what we call a, a current dipole. So we can either use an equivalent current dipole if we're looking for one source across the brain, or maybe two sources using two dipoles and try to fit them to the data. How do these the activity of these dipoles uh, explain the data? Uh, or we can use techniques where we position dipoles across the whole the cortex and we try to estimate the, the, uh, the amplitudes of all those elemental dipoles across the whole brain and that would give us a nice and colorful image uh, which is um, basically an equivalent of neuroimaging uh, done with MEG and EEG which is looking at across the whole brain what is the amplitude of the sources um, across the cortex. Um, so basically we could technically separate the source estimation techniques into two families again what is source estimation it's how do i go from recorded signals with eeg and meg that are recorded obviously at the, at the, at the surface down to estimating the cortical activity within the brain right and so one family of, of techniques is using dipole fitting um or we also refer to this as dipole localization so if you uh, simulate activity in three areas here uh, and then you try to see um, where would uh, where are the best fitting dipoles that would explain this data that's one approach the second approach is to use uh, is what we call distributed sources where basically again if you're using the same simulation um, you try to you position dipoles across the whole surface of the cortex and then you try to estimate the amplitude of all those dipoles so this could be for example 10,000 dipoles distributed across the whole uh, mesh of your brain. And you're solving the inverse problem by trying to identify what is the amplitude of all of those sources that best explain the data recorded at the surface. And so you see these give different uh, results. One is point-like dipole fits. And on the other hand, you have here distributed sources. Um, and then you can do some thresholding using statistics, for instance, to identify the peaks of this activity. Um, a quick word about um, connectivity analysis. Um, obviously, this is something that is of high interest, and this has been done in, in, uh, in many fields in uh, neuroimaging or many topics um, rely on exploring um, interaction between brain areas, both during resting state, but also during active tasks. Um, and so this is also done with EEG and MEG. Um, there are time domain metrics. Uh, like looking at correlation between uh, signals recorded in different brain areas. And there are metrics that are applied in the frequency domain. Some of these involve, um, includes, for instance, coherence, magnitude squared coherence, phase lag index, um, amplitude amplitude coupling. Um, so there are many, many tools that you can use to try and estimate the interaction between brain areas um, in the frequency domain. And why, again, is it important to be able to do this in the frequency domain? It's because we have a lot of hypotheses about the role of different frequencies or brain rhythms in cognition. And so the, there's a lot of evidence showing that interaction between brain areas also happens within those, these specific frequencies. So the way two brain areas might interact in the alpha range can be very different to the way they interact in higher frequency like beta um, or gamma. Um, another point to mention within connectivity analysis for EEG and MEG is the, um, the use of directional measures. In other words, measures that are going to inform you about the flow of information from one location to the other. So um, one of the probably most well-known metrics for directional um, connectivity measures, it would be uh, range of causality. But there's also other techniques such as partial directed coherence um, and so on and so forth. 
Um, I do have um, a specific talk um, on um, estimating interactions from EEG and MEG, uh, where I go through all these different methods uh, and techniques and also give the equations for them. So that would be something that I'll, I'll be happy to share with you for those of you who are, who are interested. Okay, so maybe before I start talking about tools and packages, just want to wrap up, give you an overview of what I just mentioned. So um, we talked very briefly about a historical overview of how EEG emerged back in the 1920s and the arrival of MEG back in 1972. Uh, and that these two techniques measure essentially the same type of underlying electrophysiological signals, which basically comes from synchronous activity mainly postsynaptic potentials happening at the same time that they can sum up and become sufficiently strong that they are detectable at the sensor level. Um, after that, we talked about um, the um, pre-processing steps. So where do you start when you're doing an EEG analysis or MEG analysis? So the first step is to look at your data um, and see whether you have any artifacts um, and try to make sure that you clean it properly. So what you would do is um, you can either reject um, data that is noisy because it can be uh, improved or and ideally uh, you would actually not reject data segments because you want to keep as much data as you can, but you would be uh, correcting um, for that. So in other words, cleaning your data. One way to use that to do that is by running ICA. ICA will give you independent components uh, and you can find some independent components that clearly uh, capture um, some artifacts, for example, heartbeat, or eye movements. So what you can do is you can exclude those independent components. So that's one way to clean the data. Um, after that, we talked about um, the notion of um, either, so basically doing the analysis in the time domain or in the time frequency space. Um, we said the most straightforward, simple analysis of EEG data or MEG data is to take a repetition of your trials if you do have events occurring, like for example, the button presses or visual stimuli coming on and you simply average all those data segments uh, with respect to, it, to your time zero for each trial. That gives you what we call um, uh, an evoked potential or an event-related potential, an ERP. And this is something that is, has been very well studied um, and we know how these are altered in, in health and in, in disease and, and so on. So, so that's um, a very well-known and established marker. But time domain analysis misses a lot of information. So depending on what your question is, you might want to go to the frequency domain and look at frequency components in EEG and MEG. And this is what makes EEG and MEG very rich in terms of signals because there are um, multiple dimensions where you can look at the data and extract useful and complementary information. So what you can find from a time domain analysis could be very interesting and you can still find in the frequency domain uh, complementary information that does not overlap with what you observe in the time domain. One important venue for doing that is looking at, for example, oscillations, these rhythmic activity in the brain, which are uh, very ubiquitous and prominent in the brain and are thought to represent um, cognitive um, um, processes um, and to also be a good marker of cognitive states, but also um, a good marker for differences between, let's say, healthy brains and um, uh, brains in, in with disorders, um, be it psychiatry, neurology, um, and others. Um, so to do that, we use time frequency analysis or uh, or simply power and spectral power analysis. Many techniques are available for that, including using um, Fourier transform based analysis, or uh, for the time frequency, you could use wavelet analysis or the Hilbert transform. I didn't have time to go into the details of these techniques, um, but I just wanted to give you an overview. Um, now, the, after that, we briefly talked about the relationship between uh, recordings done at the surface um, of the brain, and sometimes you see this very nice representation on a cortical level of EEG activity or brain activity uh, or MEG activity, but actually represented on an actual 3D mesh of the brain. So how do we do that? That's the result of what we call source estimation techniques. So you go from the sensor level and you solve what we call an inverse problem uh, to get from a representation where you have, let's say, just 200 sensors to solving a problem where you're actually estimating the activity of 10,000 nodes and you have an amplitude estimation for all of those nodes. Getting to that is solving the inverse problem and there are many techniques to do that. 
Spatial filtering is one of them, minimum norm estimates is one of them, and there are more. Um, and so these are techniques that are already developed and implemented in many toolboxes, which we'll talk about soon. Um, I think that, that about, uh, that's, that's about it. Uh, now I'm just going to run you through some uh, tools, some packages um, that I recommend um, and give you some pointers towards maybe some resources that could be helpful for this uh, brain hack book. Okay, so um, yeah, most of the, the, the tools that I'll be, uh, actually all of the tools that I'll be uh, mentioning here are open source uh, software packages. Um, because I think definitely this is the way to go. And so there's bad news and there's good news. Uh, let's start with the good news. The good news is that there are many open source tools available for EEG uh, MEG uh, data processing. Uh, bad news is also that there are many open source tools available for EEG MEG and data processing. So why is this good and bad? Obviously it's good because it's good to have all these sources uh, for tools that we can access um, open source uh, environments and, and apply them. Uh, but in many fields, it has been sometimes problematic when we have a lot of tools, because then the question is, which one should I use? Different labs will be using different tools. Um, and it's not always clear how do the results differ if I use one technique or the other. And within the space of a master's degree or a PhD program, or, and even more in the case of a few weeks or a few months on a research project or in a brain hack school, you don't have time to apply all the tools to compare them. So you will need to uh, choose uh, the, the, the tools that you, you think are, are best suited to your, uh, to your question. Um, you can see here a, a quick overview of some, of some tools. Um, so ME Python is one, both for MEG and EEG data analysis. Um, Field Trip is another one, uh, Brainstorm, EEG Lab, um, and then there's a range of utilities and other packages that are closely related to processing your data from MEG and MEG, uh, including scikit-learn, which I've probably you've already heard about in the, in the school, um, VisBrain, um, R, um, and many other um, packages and tools um, that, are, that, that can be used. Um, the question often arises um, when people are asking us, well, should we use Python-based tools or there are also some toolboxes that are um, available and open source uh, in MATLAB. Um, I'm not quite sure that there's um, a real battle going on here that is of any interest. So of course, it's, it's, I think it's a bit of a pointless battle. The important thing is that you actually manage to, um, to do what you want to do. Um, and that you find a tool that you're most um, capable of, uh, of using. In other words, um, even if you think this other tool might be potentially better, uh, at the end of the day, the tool that you master best and that you manage to do what you want to do with is just, just perfectly fine if it solves your problem. Um, if you're stuck with a tool because you've reached the capabilities of the of functionalities of that tool, uh, and then, then you'll probably need to move on to something else. Also, what's important is the environment and the support you can get. So if you're in a lab where everybody um, is using a specific toolbox, it might be a good idea to use that toolbox at least to the point where you can have that expertise and support. Um, and then maybe later on in time, when you're entirely independent, you may choice, uh, choose um, for any reason uh, that you want to move on to other toolbox. But I think um, the community support is really important. And uh, thankfully, the community support is quite strong for uh, all open source uh, tools. Um, and this has been also growing specifically for, uh, for Python-based um, tools. So one uh, toolbox I mentioned is uh, MNE Python. So it's an open source Python package for exploring, but also visualizing and analyzing um, neurophysiological data such as MEG, EEG, and electrophysiological uh, invasive recordings such as uh, ECOG. Um, it has different modules that you can uh, find out about by going to the, to the website. Um, the, on the, the GitHub, it's MNE Tools, MNE Python. I've put the link down here at the bottom, so you'll have the slides later on. Uh, it's very easy to find. Um, there's an examples gallery where you can see um, different functionalities um, and, and different functions for the input outputs of your data. Um, but also many pre-processing tools that also includes the um, ICA components that I mentioned before. Um, also re-referencing your data, which is something that uh, you would do in EEG, but you won't uh, have to do that with MEG, but uh, data re-referencing is, is an important uh, step in your analysis if you're doing EEG. 
um, detecting um, eye artifacts, so EOG artifacts and so on and so forth. So this, uh, this is all available in MNU Python. Um, I mean, Python interfaces very nicely with tools for machine learning. So basically, if, you, if you're interested in decoding, encoding, and MVPA, there are many tools that are already seamlessly linked to, um, um, to the other functionalities of, of MNU Python. So, so that, that will be, um, you can see here a list um, and um, many tools to play around with, with, with MNU. Um, I just wanted to mention, this is another example. Um, for those of you who might be more familiar with R, this is an EEG analysis um, uh, tools, uh, utilities that were made available by Matt Craddock. Um, and so I've um, put the link up here. It was related to an EEG workshop that was given. Um, and so you might want to uh, test that if you're familiar with, uh, with R. That could be also an interesting place to start. Um, also, um, there are um, EEG notebooks that were made available through uh, Neurotech X. And I've also provided the links here. Um, and basically these are EG notebooks that allow you to run some um, basic and standard or we could, we could call classical EG experiments based on Python um, in the form of Jupyter notebooks, which is a good thing. And also um, uh, most of these would want you uh, to install the uh, Muse software. So Muse is a, is a low cost EEG setup uh, that comes with its software. Um, and um, if you want to play around with the with the DIY EEG experiments, um, getting hold of a Muse setup is not very difficult. Um, and, and this could be something worth exploring if you want to actually acquire data or do even online analysis or a PCI type um, project. There are other open source software uh, that come from, uh, from my lab. Uh, this includes NeuroPyCon, uh, BrainPipe, VisBrain, Sleep, TensorPack, Spinky, so I don't have time to go through all of them, um, but you can find out more about them if you're interested. I will just probably tell you about one or two of them in a second. Um, yeah, so BrainPipe is one tool that allows you to, to do some electrophysiological signal processing on your data, be it MEG or EG, and easily interface with scikit-learn. Uh, so it's on, it's on GitHub um, and it's um, primarily um, coded by my uh, former PhD student, Etienne Combrisson. Uh, another tool that Etienne developed is called TensorPack. So PAC is for the computation of phase amplitude coupling, which is a measure I did not have time to go into the details of that today. But basically it's an looking at cross-frequency interactions. Again, something that is uh, very interesting to do with EEG or MEG data is look at how different rhythms are coupled to one another. To do that, you want to measure of inter-frequency uh, coupling. And TensorPack provides very fast tools to do that through tensor computation. Um, these are just some examples of figures uh, that come out of TensorPack. Um, this too. Um, now for brain data visualization, um, a tool that I would recommend, um, which is a generic tool that can be applied with many types of data, um, primarily driven towards um, electrophysiological uh, data or source level data and can easily be um, incorporate also um, neuroimaging data from, for example, fMRI or other uh, modalities. It's called VisBrain um, and the website is visbrain.org. It's all open source, uh, all Python and um, very efficiently coded, uh, I, I would say. Um, you can hear, see here some examples of the figures that you can generate using um, VisBrain. Again, it's a purely visualization, so it doesn't do any computation um, as such. Um, it does have some modules for looking at um, specifically sleep signals, for instance, and some properties of that, but it's primarily a visualization tool. Um, again, these are just some uh, examples. One thing to note about VisBrain is that it's GPU accelerated, so, so it's, it's actually very efficient. You can see here different uh, visualizations of cortical and subcortical areas, and you can, you, it's very rich in terms of easily changing your color bars and different um, uh, coloring, shading, and, um, and, and things that you might want to change. It can also easily create uh, paper-ready um, versions of your, of your figures with high resolution. Sleep is a, model, is a module within VisBrain that allows you to do very um, standard analysis of sleep data. So if you're looking at sleep data, and you want to detect, for example, some um, features such as uh, K-complexes or um, uh, spindles, so on and so forth, this might be worth trying out. Uh, you can also incorporate hypnograms and things like that. So this is 
if you're looking at sleep, um, I'd also recommend using the sleep module from uh, VisBrain uh, as an open source um, uh, available toolbox. What about data resources? Um, there are many, um, well, not so many for MEC, um, e.g. there might be more, but for MEC, there are still a number of interesting resources. Um, HCP is one of them, so the Human Connectome Project also has resting state MEC data, in addition to fMRI, obviously. Um, so there are, I think, about 100 um, data from 100 individuals at the, on the HCP, so the Human Connectome. Um, Omega is also a more recent development, so it's um, resting state MEG data sets from Montreal, both from University of Montreal and McGill. Um, CAMCAN uh, is a, is a Cambridge-based, also a database for resting state and tasks uh, uh, with MEG, and it has over 600 uh, participants. Um, the MNI Open IEG Atlas is also a recent initiative, and this is a collection, and these are databases of intracranial recordings in epilepsy patients. Um, that is also worth looking into if, if you're interested in that. And as I said, there are many more, and there are tools available also on Google to, uh, to search for, uh, for databases. Okay, so with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. I, I tried to touch on, without going too much into details or depth, of those different sections, but I try to give you a, a global overview. Um, I have many much more material that I can share and I can discuss with you if some of you are interested in, in more specifics, but I, I hope that this sort of gives you a, a global view of the different uh, types of analysis and the, the, the strengths of some of these uh, approaches using EEG and, um, and MEC. Um, and I'd be, um, I think I've worked up nearly close to one hour, so um, I'm just going to stop here and um, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have. Obviously, I'm going to be sharing these slides with you um, in the next uh, minutes. That's wonderful. Thanks a lot, uh, <coughs> Karim. So there's a, a question from uh, Ashraf who is asking, does source estimation permit to localize dipoles only at the cortical level or in the deep brain limbic system as well? So that's a very uh, good question. Um, this has been debated for a long time. Um, for, for a long time, people used to believe that deep structures cannot be reached with EEG or MEG, even less so with MEG. Some people said, well, maybe with EEG a bit more, but not with MEG. But um, more and more evidence now points to the fact that you can actually detect signals from deeper subcortical structures, including hippocampus, including a cerebellum, uh, thalamus. So, so my answer to that would be yes, you can, but you need to um, keep in mind that it's less reliable. So, what you would ideally want to do from the get-go, if you know that you're in that the cerebellum is an important structure for the cognitive task that you want to explore, you need to make sure that your the design of your experiment um, is um, uh, the design of your experiment is actually tailored towards. Um, increasing your capability of capturing uh, cerebellum. And what do I mean by that is that, for example, you know that the signal to noise ratio is going to be worse in these deep structures, so you'll need to have much more repetitions, many more repetitions, so you need to have more data. Um, another thing that you can do is these brain areas, deep structures might not be easy to detect with, a, with just a dipole fit, but if you're looking at interactions, you might be able, if this, for example, cerebellum interacts or is coupled to the activity of the motor cortex. By using connectivity analysis between the motor cortex and the rest of the brain, cortical, subcortical, you might be able to pick up the cerebellum because it's tightly coupled to a cortical structure. So there are many tools and techniques that you can uh, explore to increase your chances of getting subcortical structures. So uh, to summarize that uh, long answer, I would say, yes, it is possible, but you need to, um, make sure that your experimental design gives you the data that's going to allow you to, 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 to do that. And there are a few papers now published. We have published a recent article in NeuroImage um, just a few weeks ago about uh, detecting the cerebellar activities of the cerebellum using MEG and EEG. Uh, so it's a review paper that, uh, that basically goes through the whole question in detail. And there have been um, also some papers uh, reporting detecting hippocampus with MEG or EEG. Um, so now more and more it's, it's starting to become an acceptable um, 
thing. So it's not long time ago, as I said, people say, no, you could never go to deep structures with EGMA. And uh, this has now changed, um, which is good news.